Hi, this is Jim Feist in Las Vegas. I'm on a 56 and 32 college basketball run, including my tournament game of the year last week on Rhode Island, and they defeated Creighton 84-72. I have plays daily on Vegas Sports Masters. That's right, Vegas Sports Masters, including my college bailout game of the month on Thursday and a backboard buster game of the month, Friday, each for $25. I also have a tournament special, the rest of the college hoops. That's right, the rest of the college hoops, including the Sweet 16 for $49 and both of those games of the month. That's right, all those games plus the games of the month by calling Vegas Sports Masters at 888-777. 4155. I'll repeat that. 888 777 4155. 4155. Now stay tuned as Dave Coken and I preview the Sweet 16 on Proline. Welcome to Proline Daily, the longest running sports handicapping show in America, direct from Las Vegas. It is Sweet 16 weekend as we take a look at Friday, March the 24th. Action, we've got four more games tonight. Four decided last night. Jim Feist is here with me. I'm Dave Koken. Jim, it's now 56 and 32 with your college basketball run, so it continues. It, you know, it's it's been really, really, really good. Uh, eight and four with all my plays on Thursday, including my tournament bailout game of the month with Xavier, a straight-up winner. Uh, and, gee, you have to say, how this this Xavier coach is really good, but I, I'm really happy that I got I was on them and I've been on them. Let's talk a little about last night. Um, you, you know I don't want to I don't want to rip Purdue or take anything away from Kansas because Kansas was absolutely great in the game, but boy it you don't often see a team just pack it in and tap out like Purdue did in the second half of that game. They just gave up and stopped running back on defense. Uh, Kind of an embarrassing way to end a good season. Well, it really, really was, Dave. I mean, you know, I haven't. I go back to what I've been talking about for a long time in the college this year. There really is no great team. There's nobody that you can say this team's got it all, and they come to play every day, unless you go to a team like Xavier who comes to play every day and they give 100% every day and they got a great coach. No, they do not have the talent, but I'm going to kind of transition into something here. You've got to have enough pride to say, I'm going to fight to the end. I'm yeah. not going to, I'm not going to give up. And they don't. I want to, I want to go to the one other game and analyze it right here online for everybody to listen to. Last night, Gonzaga won a game against West Virginia. They were favored by three, three and a half. I personally had West Virginia. I pushed on about 80% of the money that I had on it. I did collect on the three and a half that I had. And I lost a little bit on the money line bet. So, but let's look at this game. Then you'll say Gonzaga, they, they proved that they can hang with a tough team. Well, really, let's talk about that. What did West Virginia do in this game? They shot 16 for 60. Dave, you and I, at our advanced ages, could have done better than 16 for 60 from the field. Five for 23 from three-point land. This team gave up a million opportunities to get beat. They are not that solid. Yeah, we can look at it and say, oh, yeah, they beat a good team. They beat a team from a power conference they, they didn't cover the spread. They actually lost the spread in some spots. But let's get real. When you beat a team by three points that shot 16 for 60, three from the five from 20 from of 23 from three point land, it's absolutely amazing. And of course, at the end of the game, their foul shooting killed them too. But I give credit to Mark Pugh and Gonzaga for what they've accomplished, one loss all year. But I got to get real and say, how many teams are capable of shooting 16 for 60? Yeah, that was ugly. 
Uh, and, and, you know, give Gonzaga credit also. They found a way to fight through. West Virginia played some great defense last night. And the Mountaineers' problems uh, came to the forefront once again. They just don't shoot the ball very well. They had a lot of games like that this season, and it showed up again at the wrong time last night. The other two games last night, we got to touch on the uh, – we'll save Michigan and Oregon because that was just a phenomenal basketball game. Oh, Xavier and Arizona, uh, full credit to Xavier – they looked like they were dead. It was, what, 69-61? Uh, and they're they're pretty much toast. And Arizona melted. Uh, and I, for, for the life of me, don't understand what Arizona was doing on that last possession. It was good by me. I didn't want overtime. I had Xavier in the game. And you never want overtime if you had the dog. Uh, so I was real happy with what they decided to do, which was go for the win with a three-pointer. But it was a contested three-pointer you got to drive the basket in that situation. You've got the better basketball team. You kind of want overtime. So go for the higher percentage shot and try and get it to OT. If there's nothing there, maybe you can kick it out and take a three. But I thought that was a terrible play that Trier ran. And uh, and Arizona's going home. Now, the other game last night, this, was, this lived up to billing in every way. This was a tremendous basketball game between Michigan and Oregon. And... Jim, somebody had to win and somebody had to lose, and Oregon managed to make the last shot and got the win. That was a phenomenal basketball game. That, that was one of the best basketball games I've seen in years. It was, it was incredible. Um, it wasn't good for my pocket. I had Michigan in the game. But the, um, you know, I pushed on some of the, you know, and it, I didn't know I had one at one spot. But most of, most of the bets, I was laying one or getting pick them. So I had Michigan lost that bet, but still, hats off. These guys played hard. The game was dead even all the way. Uh, the three-point shooting by Michigan was probably the letdown. And I'll tell you, Oregon hit their three-pointers 47% from the field. That's incredible. Eight out of 17. Uh, they did remarkable, and and uh, Michigan wasn't even close to that. They hit 35%. But and, you know, the one other thing. I mean, the two biggest plays in the game were by Bell. Offensive rebounds, one off a foul shot and the other one off a field goal miss. And those were the two biggest plays in the game. That's why Oregon won, was the offensive rebounding by Bell at the end of the game. No question. That, that, yeah, that one play that where they got the extra possession, that was remarkable. Uh, they had, they had uh, 36 rebounds in the game to 31 for Michigan. That was big. That's a, that's a gives you know when they look at their the foul shooting there were nine of sixteen, where Michigan was seven of of seven. So they did get more opportunities, but they only got two more in the. It was a hell of a game. It could have if they played ten times, it'd probably be split because they really played well. Two, two good coaches. That was really really quality basketball. I enjoyed that game a lot. Let's uh let's look at tonight's games. Uh, I have. Two plays. One I gave out as a free play in the South Carolina Baylor game. The other one's Wisconsin and Florida, so I don't want to talk about that much. Hopefully, you'll buy those selections and and get on the winning side with me because I think I've got the right side in that game. Uh, which games are you involved in? Well, it'd be a shorter list if you talked about what games I'm not involved in. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, you know, I have I have power ratings and situational advantages in each game. The question is, sometimes your power ratings lean you to the right and your situations will lean you to the left. So I don't, I have two, I have two underplays uh, it, going tonight and I have two sides, well actually, uh, yeah, one, two, three sides going. So I have three sides and two unders. Uh, you know, it has been an over, uh, tournament but because of the over tendency and bias you know since the beginning uh, we're starting to see some unders and last night three out of the four games went under and the yep. only one that went over is what you alluded to Dave is when Purdue just stopped playing they just quit and uh, when that happened we got 164 point, you know we got 98 64 66. So that went that went over substantially, but it was basically due to the fact that Purdue quit playing. It was an embarrassment for the Big Ten yes. and for their program specifically. 
So let's try and break down. Uh, I think the the interesting game to me, from a breakdown standpoint, is South Carolina and Baylor, because and that that might be a good game to talk about. The, the Gamecocks are coming off an absolutely amazing second half of basketball against Duke. That was that was about as good as a team can play. And the interesting thing was it was right on the heels of a half where they were just awful. Uh, South Carolina was seven for thirty-five in the first half of that game against UCL or against uh, uh, Duke, and then they had a phenomenal second half. Which South Carolina team is going to show up tonight? That's the, that's going to decide what happens in this matchup. We know South Carolina is going to play great defense because they always do. I think Baylor might be a little underrated defensively. Baylor also can get a little scatter shot on offense at times. The two big guys are going to be the keys here. Thornwell is the star for South Carolina and uh, Mobley for Oregon. And I, I think whichever one has the better game tonight, whichever the two superstars has the better game, I think that team's going to be moving on to the Elite Eight. Well, let's talk about a little. I totally agree. I want to add one thing that you didn't bring up. Um, South Carolina scored 65 points in, in the final... 20, 20 minutes against Duke the other night, which is absolutely incredible. Um, to score 65 points in a game is normally your game anyway, but to do it in a half, they did it in a half against Duke. But Duke was playing man-to-man defense. Yeah. Now, the difference here tonight, and this is where the handicappers want to want to look at a game and say, okay, what is the situation in this game that we haven't seen before or recently, and if we've seen it before or recently, what happened then? So this is where it, it comes down to digging. And this is, I mean, Dave, you and I, I don't know how much we sleep, but I know we're working 18 hours a day just digging through all this stuff. And and then I'm gonna get to baseball because you've been a baseball expert for years and how much work that takes. Oh. So, I mean, this is, a it's almost like somebody in this business that really digs in it. You really don't have a life, you know, you bet. And if you do have a life, you better have an understanding mate because this this is tough, but then getting back to this, Baylor is going to sit back in the zone in this game. And that is not what South Carolina faced in their last game when they scored the 65 and a half. Now the question there is, can Baylor overcome a zone? Now, South what, Carolina. Pardon me? South Carolina has to overcome the zone. Yeah, excuse me, yes. Now, the, the reverse is, what is South Carolina going to do on defense? That they, are, most, they play mostly man-to-man. And by the way, I, I apologize to uh, to Motley, who I called Mobley. I don't know why I did that. His name is Motley for, uh, for Baylor. Now, South Carolina is going to play mostly man, and, and if they play... Fierce man-to-man defense. That's Frank Martin's trademark. Baylor, I would call their defense more uh, situational because they'll switch between man-to-man and zone. So South Carolina is going to have to figure out what they're doing defensively. Yeah, I mean, you know, these teams had had their periods of time. I might mention that Baylor at one time during the season was ranked number one in the country. Now, that's... That that lasted about a minute. those, Those rankings are very fraudulent because the media does that. The media has their head totally up their ass most of the time. So, and they don't know what they're doing. So the number one team in the country was never Baylor, although they might've put them there. But when you match up these games, when you look at, like for example, Gonzaga against West Virginia, can Gonzaga handle the press? Well, they ended up winning the game. But when you analyze the box score, you say, my God, if anybody, would have hit 30% of their shots, they'd have beat them by 10. So these are the things that you have to, if you want to win at this business, you have to dig down into the facts and do a deep dive into the facts, not just the cursory, oh, this is the final score, and not care how they got there. Yeah, and you know, and going back to that Gonzaga game for a minute, if you look at the box score, you wonder how they won the game. Yeah. Uh, they lost. They lost the rebounding. West Virginia had 20 offensive rebounds in the game. Uh, the turnovers weren't 
a huge split, but West Virginia was plus three net on turnovers. Uh, actually, West Virginia shot it better from the foul line. They were 21 for 29, which is okay. Gonzaga missed 11 free throws in the game, so they only shot uh, 65%, 66% from the line last night. But it goes back to the sh- you got to put the ball in the basket. Uh, and, uh, you know, 11 for 37 on twos, 5 for 23 on threes. That's going to be the story tonight in the South Carolina Baylor game. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And it, look, if South Carolina, they're not a good shooting team. Uh, for the season, they're shooting 33% on threes, which is below average, and only 46% on twos, which is way below average. Now, defensively, they're tremendous, but they're going to have to find a way to make more shots than their season average if they want to move on in this game. They can do it. Uh, if they bottled what, if they were able to bottle half of what they did in the second half against Duke last night or uh, last Sunday, they'll win. Uh, but that's that's the big key going into this game. And I actually I think we have different opinions on this one. Well, here's, you know, I, I like I said, I'm going to go back to the beginning of, of I don't think we're looking at great pedigree for any of either of these teams. I think we're looking at good teams that occasionally play awful and occasionally play great. Now, if you go back to the West Virginia game, they played awful last night and still barely lost the game. Against Notre Dame, they played great. So if you look at those two performances, they're so diverse, there's no, there's no way to handicap who the, what they would do the next time out because they, they were so inconsistent. It's it's the same thing with most of these teams. The top teams would probably right now, Kansas, it, it, after what they did last night, in most people's eyes, they're going to look as the best team. But however, Purdue did quit and Kansas did play at home, basically. So there's a lot of factors involved in that. So they're going to move on you know, from there, and now you're going to have to use those factors in your thinking. We're not dealing with A plus teams. We're dealing with A minus or B plus teams, and that's what we're getting. That's why you really have to dig down as far as you have to into the stats, into the motivation, and into the coaching. And coaching does come into play. Yeah. Now, we we'll talk about this one game coming up today or tomorrow uh, is Xavier and, this, and Chris Mack is a great coach. And I don't know, Dave, do you think he's going to move on to another position after, after this season? I, you know, I mean, if I were Indiana, I'd be throwing all kinds of money at him. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, simple the as that. I, mean, that, that I, I would go after Chris back. I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. Is Xavier, I think Xavier pays pretty well. Uh, but uh, you know, in the big 10 is more of a destination location and Indiana has the incredible tradition uh, but I have no idea what Mac's going to do. He's got it pretty good at Xavier. Some of these coaches don't want to leave their spots. Mark Few is a good example of that. He's gotten a ton of offers over the years, but he's never left Spokane. And I think right now he's kind of happy he's there. And, you know, Xavier has that same kind of, of tradition. I mean, this team's in the Sweet 16 every year now. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of like... Don't give that up. It, it's Some of these small schools, or we think of as small schools, they're not the power teams like the Butlers, uh, the you know, and Xavier. We could actually move on a little bit into um, into Saturday matchups, Dave. I mean, I'm not going to pick any sides here, but this Oregon Kansas matchup is a tremendous one. Xavier, we're team we're talking about against Gonzaga, and we're talking about some opening numbers. The opener was Kansas over Oregon six points and now it's six and a half so they're betting kansas and off of the performance against purdue i can understand that gonzaga opened eight it's now eight and a half so the favorites are getting money and uh so there's two big games that are going to happen on saturday um that that are really interesting to think about talk about and dig into which i've already begun to do yeah i as have i i'll give you my power ratings on the two games. Uh, this doesn't mean I'll bet these sides. Now, the Kansas is interesting because uh, my neutral court power rating in Oregon, Kansas, is Kansas 
minus 4.3. But this isn't a neutral court. So you have to decide what to do as far as adding some kind of a home court advantage to Kansas. I'm giving him two points uh, for the site. So that brings it to 6.3. And that basically is a no play. It's right on the number, basically. Uh, now the other game, the power rating, this is interesting. The power rating is high. I have Gonzaga 11.6, but, and this is a big but, that's a full season power rating, and Xavier is obviously playing a lot better than that. Also, Xavier, their power rating took a big tumble uh, in the first several games after the Sumner injury. Well, they've gotten, they've obviously gotten past that now, and it's as if he was never there, which is amazing because the guy's a great player. So I don't know that you can draw a lot off those power ratings, but for people who like that stuff, those, again, neutral court only, Kansas 4.3 and Gonzaga 11.6. Uh, does Gonzaga have any home court advantage with the game being in San Jose? I didn't give them one, but based on what I saw last night, I think Gonzaga might, I might have to add a point to that just to the power rating. They're going to have the crowd on sa on uh, Saturday against Xavier, and that, that doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, there were two losers, uh, the crowds, people that traveled to those that site, that their their team is no longer in it. Now, some of those people are going to stay. Probably the majority of them will stay to watch these games since they took a long trip to get there. Then the question is, will they root for the underdog, which a lot of people do. A lot of people that don't have any... Uh, skin in the game will root for the underdog because it's a Cinderella story. And yep. It, we always like that. Well, Xavier is the biggest Cinderella story we have going in the entire tournament. So, However, the flip side of that is that, and I can tell you this from personal experience, these Gonzaga fans really travel. Uh, they play their West Coast Conference tournament here at the Orleans, and it's <laughs> it's like 90% Gonzaga. I mean, they absolutely, they buy all the tickets. Uh, they just absolutely pack the place. So you know they're going to be in Spokane, uh, make the trip from Spokane to uh, to San Jose. It's not that long a trip, actually. And uh, I think this crowd's going to be huge for Gonzaga. And I also think this, Xavier is a Cinderella story, but isn't Gonzaga the ultimate Cinderella story? The, uh, you know, the, the, a mid, they're a mid-major. That's... <laughs> They're from a mid-major conference, less of a conference than Xavier's from, actually. Xavier's from more of a, a major conference. Uh, you know, the Big East is still a, a good top league. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think the crowd here is going to be very, very pro-Gonzaga. I don't think that matters to Xavier, and uh, I'm not giving it a whole lot of weight. One point at the most. Well, that, I think your, your analysis is right on, at, you know, putting it together. The question is, do you want to lay nine points? Or That's you want a lot to of points. points. You know, because at some point in time, with a, a number sitting at eight and a half, you're going to see eights and you're going to see nines. Yeah, and there's one other thing. I think the pressure is on Gonzaga. Well, and yeah, it is. I mean, they've been they've been touted as a top team for many, many years, and this and this is the first chance they've really had to get to a Final Four. Right, uh, and they're big favorites, that, and they're going to know it. So there's there's a lot of pressure on them in this game, and we'll see how they respond. I think those are intangibles that you have to weigh into the analysis. You can't just just play off the power rating numbers. If I if I were playing just off the numbers, I'd I'd already have my bet in on Gonzaga because eight eight and a half uh, on the power ratings. I, I give them an edge there, and actually it's a, actually a decent edge. Uh, but I don't know whether I'm going to back that yet, and I want to dig a little more in that game before I make any wagers. And, uh, uh how about coaching edges? We see a coaching edge there at all. I'm not going against Chris Mack on a coaching edge. Yeah. That guy's as good as it gets. How about strength of schedule? Uh, let's see. I've got that right in front of me, actually. Gonzaga, strength of schedule uh, is looks like 104. This is off Ken Palm, actually. And uh, Xavier, their strength of schedule is 12. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you know, they play in a lot better league. Yeah, that's right. They do. Um, 
I mean, although Gonzaga has played some very tough teams, I mean, his team did beat Arizona earlier in the year. Um, well, yeah, it, it, interesting. On the non-conference strength of schedule, though, Gonzaga won 28 and uh, Xavier 38. So Xavier's played the iron all year long, and they do schedule top. I mean, if you look at Xavier's non-conference schedule, uh, Clemson, uh, Baylor, which they lost to, Colorado on the road, which they lost to. They played Utah. Wake Forest was a good team. And then they get into conference play, obviously, and it was a lot better as opposed to Gonzaga. Uh, what did Gonzaga? Uh, let's see, Gonzaga's non-conference schedule. This is forever ago, so don't know what it matters. San Diego State, but they were way down this year. They beat Florida on a neutral court. They beat Iowa State on a neutral court. They beat Arizona on a neutral court. Got a decent win against Tennessee in a, uh, we'll call it a semi-road game. So they've got, you know, They've got tournament toughness, if you will, as well. Uh, and, and both teams, by the way, were involved in early season tournaments. Gonzaga won theirs. Uh, that was uh, where they knocked off Iowa State in the finals and beat Florida before they got to that game. And Xavier uh, played in a non-conference tournament, uh, a, a early season tournament. And they also won uh, beating Missouri, Clemson, and Northern Iowa. So these teams know how to win big games. It's going to be a heck of a battle. Before... Uh... Sumner went down. I think Xavier was 18 and one, and then then they lost. I think six games in a row after he got hurt, and then they no won. no they they lost more than that. Uh, they were let's see Sumner. Let me check and see what they were when Sumner got hurt. I mean they went real bad after he got hurt. Sumner played the first 21 games, so through 21 games, they were 15 and six. And then they went bad. Uh, they beat Seton Hall, they beat Creighton, they beat DePaul, then lost six in a row before beating DePaul, and then they beat DePaul again in the Big East tournament. Beat Butler, lost to Creighton, and, well, we know what they've done in the NCAA tournament. So they've now won uh, seven of their last eight, and two of those were against DePaul, which can't play, but, then, you know, the rest of them were impressive wins. That's going to be fun, and uh, hopefully we'll come up with something good on that game. In the meantime, I guess uh, we've talked enough today. So, again, a reminder, first of all, on the free plays, if you want to get free plays every day, they're on a recorded message at 888-294-1970. And you can also get the game uh, via text message, Jim. That's right. You can follow me, uh, first of all, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, at Jim Fly Sports, And you can get free plays every day by texting Game, G-A-M-E, just spell it out on your phone, G-A-M-E, to 25827, and we'll send you free play right to your cell phone each and every day. And I have to tell you to go to jimfice.com and check the site out. If you want my plays, check on, you know, click on the Jim Fice selections. It'll get right to a page. Same thing for Dave. And we have great information there. We've got the fast facts. And Dave, earlier you said, you mentioned baseball, but you didn't dig into it. And I'll tell you, Dave is really an expert in baseball. He's been betting the preseason baseball, doing quite well. And I know he's uh, ready. Not the last couple of days I haven't, so. <laughs> well, we, we all stub our toes. This is not yeah, one I, of the things. Bookmakers are not out there just to give us money. No, and I, I ran into some bullpen problems, which is going to happen in exhibition season. Uh, you've got guys who are not going to make the big league roster uh, pitching at the end of games sometimes. And. A couple of them went south on me, and then I had a bad play yesterday in the Brewers. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm reasonably pleased and uh, and looking forward to the regular season, obviously. 